It is my pleasure to invite longtime friend and CEO of Nest, Marwan Fawaz, uh, to stage here. Um, just a quick introduction on Marwan. Uh, Marwan has been with uh, Nest for uh, about two years, Marwan, is that right? Year and a half. Year and a half, OK. Lots happened in the last year and a half. Um, Marwan's the CEO at Nest, Alphabet Company. Uh, how many of you have a Nest at home? Yes. How many of you have two Nest devices at home? <laughs> I got six in my home. So uh, clearly, many of you guys know Nest. Six is a good number. It is a good number. I thought you were going to hand off to everybody so we all have one more at the end of the day. But uh, <laughs> anyway, prior to Nest, Marwan was also the executive vice president of Motorola Mobility, uh, where he was the CEO of Motorola Home. Uh, I'm very pleased to have Marwan here with us and share some perspectives from, from, uh, from Nest viewpoint. So thank you very much, Marwan. May I have a round of applause for Marwan here? Oh, thank you. Awesome. Good to see you again. Yeah, likewise. So good to have you. Yeah, I was, I was looking at your uh, 12 gigabyte per day per person. So <laughs> our latest camera, the 4, um, 4K, the Nest Cam IQ, that camera on a daily basis is roughly about 12 gigabytes, just that right? camera of, of traffic, of streaming. And nice. And imagine we look at every single frame of that to give you more intelligence about it. So, um, yeah. That's awesome. Well, so let's, let's start with the kind of high-level yeah. view, right? So Larry's be, Larry Page has been on, uh, on, on media multiple times saying Google is an AI-first company, or Alphabet is an AI-first company, I should yeah. say. So how, talk to us, come on, kind of what is your vision, Nest's vision on AI, and how does that, that kind of influence your roadmap and your products? Yeah, I mean, so um, everything we do, I and mean, we call this AI by design, every product we build going, going forward. Um, it becomes so foundational to, uh, to all of our services and solutions we're building. It's not just within Nest. As you look across all of Alphabet, Google, uh, especially, um, whether you're Nest or Waymo, uh, with, uh, autonomous vehicles, or even life sciences com mm -hmm. companies, and um, AI become really an imperative in principle of what we do. But um, specific to Nest, you know, we've... Um, the company started using AI even prior to the Google acquisition. Um, it was mostly focused around energy. How do we leverage a lot of information, a lot of intelligence from the thermostats to enable savings in, in energy space? Um, and, we, and we continue to evolve you know, year, um, year over year. And uh, we have the best of both worlds right now, that we have our own what we call Nest Brain organizations that we leverage so much from the Google family uh, yeah. of products and tools. And you've mentioned a couple of them on some of your slides. So um, so we get to use a lot of those tools. We get to share a lot of the learnings uh, to real world type of connected home solutions that we're using. We, and we improve on them on a daily basis. Got it. And how does that vision kind of come together? So on one hand, you have Google with this software stack that's enhancing recognition of images, improving the, the AI layer every day. And then you have the Nest product stack that's kind of marching in its own direction. How do they kind of coincide together? Give us you know, an example of two or how you know, Google, AI, and Nest uh, coincide going forward. Yeah, so, so um, we actually collaborate a lot more than what people think in a lot of, uh, especially in the AI space. So, yeah. so TensorFlow is one of the foundational uh, tools that we use. Uh, we've been using uh, FaceNet for computer vision tools. That's all Google. And so what we do that, we take that and we apply a lot of our own machine learning, our own algorithms mm -hmm. that are specific to um, capabilities within our devices. So specific to, uh, to cameras, for example, FaceNet, uh, um, FaceNet within computer vision. And so we, um, we analyze uh, key, like frame by frame type of capabilities. When we do that, it creates, it puts a lot of stress on the devices, on the cloud services, so we work very closely with the cloud team and trying to figure out, okay, how do we improve um, the processing, the uh, uh, latencies around uh, looking at a, a, every single piece of information coming back. Um, while our products may look different, but with, on the inside, there's a lot of commonalities. Got it, that's great. And, and Marwan, we talked about this in the intro presentation. AI has been you know, on the verge of you know, disrupting technology for the last 40 years. What's different this time from your viewpoint? I think you've touched on some of it already. Um, if you think about, I don't believe anything I say. That's yeah, no, I've, 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 there, were, there were good slides. Um, 
Um, you've, I, we've, I think we're getting to a, we're getting to a stage right now. There's there are a lot of tools that have matured. Mm. Um, you know, I mentioned TensorFlow, for example. We've uh, there, um, so you could use that. The the ability to to leverage a lot of kind of a cloud computing at a at a very you know uh, dynamic way that on a daily basis we provision in that capacity around that makes it so much easier. Um, the networks within the home, the broadband you becoming ubiquitous and having the ability to get better and better, not just around bandwidth and throughput, just around latencies. Um, so because you need to have that immediate response in, in dealing with live events. Um, and then I think mobility is, is pl drives a key part of this. So having just about every person, whether you're home or outside the home, a device that you carry that tells us a lot about what you want to do, where you are, your presence. Um, so bringing all confluence mm. of all of that information and starting to organize that in a way that it's actionable. And so we start taking actions around, whether around our energy services, uh, around security products, um, or areas associated with safety that we do within the home. Um, so uh, to summarize, I mean, the headlines, tools have, have gotten better. Yeah. Uh, capacity around computing has gotten, obviously, a lot more affordable, easier to use. Um, and uh, we leverage that uh, on a daily Got basis. It. So, you know, if you could project kind of five years from now, what can we expect in the connected home? Because today I have a number of Nest thermostats, I have a number of drop cams. We in hope my you'll house. double to 16 from, <laughs> from that. <laughs> if you can do facial oh, recognition. Eight or six, sorry, you're eight or six. six, six, six only six so oh, far. Okay. Uh, but you know, I have I have a bunch of drop cams. I have the Nest thermostats. I have this other thing called Ring, which you know seems to be working okay. What, what, we have a better product for you. It's, it's uh, you can just replace that. I was that, hoping yeah. you take bring some of those to uh, for me yeah, to try. We haven't but, officially uh, launched it. Actually, you can order it, but you can, <coughs> we're shipping it next month yeah. or so. But how, how do all these things talk together? If you project five years from now, what can we expect from the connected home? A lot of potential. I mean, it's it's it's. I would say we're just in the beginning, mm. and. Uh, enabling additional services, um, uh, providing kind of a solutions that, not, I mean, it's not kind of Jetson-like products that you think about. It's all about um, controls and, you know, uh, devices or things that are cool in home. It's really more thoughtful. Hmm. We think about a home as a more thoughtful products that gives you the ability that you seamlessly um, interact with it. it. It predicts things you want to do. Um, so we've... And the more the more we add devices in the home, the more that we have capability to do things um, that enable you know better living inside your home. And so, we tend to um, pack our product and devices um, with more capabilities that we could use from day one. Um, you know, our so you can recognize my face. You just uh, won't tell me yet. So we're now <laughs> we do that with our camera. So we, we do tell you that. Um, so we've as as we add more more products, whether they're uh, cameras, sensors, yeah. um, uh, radars, radios in the homes. I think the combination of all that um, and uh, starting to use that to develop more and more services that start to take care of people, um, not just um, basic things you want to do in your home, it. whether it's um, you know energy or heating, but I think at some point we will tell you more about activities related things and uh, um, your ability to live a healthier life, and stuff, you, information you want to know about you and your family and your loved ones. Um, so it's, it's exciting times. Uh, I think it's, uh, yeah. you know, we focus on safety, security, and energy, and we'll continue to build product associated with that um, and, and leveraging as much of the intelligence of the product as possible. Got it. Got it. Is, that, is that a two-year time frame? Is it a five-year time frame? Like, talk to us, then, when are some of these innovations making their way into mainstream? I think so I mean, tying personal health to devices in the home, for example, yeah. that's one big area. If somebody uh, told me, "Hey, you can't watch a football game three hours in a row; you got to get up and walk," that'd be tremendous. That'd be very. Yeah. Helpful. I don't know if we would uh, be that direct. We may suggest something. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think sooner than later. Uh, sooner than later. I think the, uh, the the it's not necessarily the uh, to put new devices in the home; it's to leverage exist, the existing devices that you got have it. today. Got it. So having six devices. Um, in your home gives us a lot more information to tell you that here's, you've been sitting for, for yeah. three hours, it's time to stand up. Got it, got it. And do you, do you feel like, you know, we as consumers kind of have to opt into one ecosystem? So, you know, I love my Nest thermostat. I really like my drop cam, but the Alexa thing actually works pretty well for me. Then Google Home. So, like, do I have to make a choice and say, I have to go all in 
on one set of products for all this to work seamlessly, or is there a world where it's heterogeneous and it all works well together? <laughs> Uh, not so much on the latter. <laughs> it's, it's much complicated than that. Uh, we we tend to be a lot more open and integrate. And we've integrated with Alexa, our products, okay. so you can control our thermostat through Alexa if you prefer. Uh, we prefer to control it through our, our Google Home product. Mm -hmm. um, and so we give consumers a choice. Um, but we, we also think that devices have to seamlessly talk to each other without you having to do something. Uh, so another, another case of intelligence and devices, so if you happen to have our Nest uh, protect, smoke detector, <coughs> carbon monoxide detector, and you happen to have our thermostats. Mm -hmm. um, and if you install that, there is nothing else you need to do but um, to, to have the devices talk to each other. We do that in the background. So uh, is it, if there is an unfortunate use case that there is a smoke or, uh, or a fire in your home, uh, the smoke detector will immediately tell your thermostat um, to, uh, to perform very important things, and that is to shut down your airflow to shut down your boilers or mm -hmm. the conditions because those three things will accelerate your fire, will accelerate um, um, you know, smoke in the home that makes it uh, more toxic. So Got it. those are the things that are, it's a device to device communication and intelligence devices we think is important. Consumers will start to re realize that. We don't talk about platform as much, as much more so about the devices and their ability to <laughs> talk to each other. And we have a our own works with Nest platform, uh, including enabling some of our competitors to, to have products that uh, connect through uh, our own user experience. Got it. Um, so I think consumers make the decision about what's easier and what's seamless for them and not so much about platform and whether it's no matter what it is. Got it. And then from, from an end market perspective, I know Nest has strong penetration in the residential or the consumer market. What about the enterprise or the business segment? Is that a focus area for you? Last week at, at Amazon's uh, instance, for example, uh, Werner Vogels announced like a whole suite of products that Amazon's going to focus on the enterprise. And I don't know if that's a that's a market you guys consider. Uh, where where does that fall on your roadmap? Yeah, I mean our, our focus is on the home. Yeah. But we do find our products. I mean, significant of our products make it into enterprise. Hmm. Um, we have not the the compatibility is much much less than it is from a home. Um, and the, there are different codes around safety and security that we have not supported, but it's a, it's a natural extension for us. Got it. Um, we start to see a lot of our security products, cameras, um, into small and medium businesses. Got it. And so we're, we're making investments to, uh, to provide the right, as simple as the right account management for them to, to, to do that. So, Got it. Um, <coughs> Yeah, it's 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 an area that we'll uh, we'll, we'll go into, but you know, our core our core focus will still stay within the home. Awesome, that's great. You you made the comment, Marvon, just a minute ago that you know you have very much of a open DNA. You kind of build an ecosystem around it. Any advice for the startups in this audience here? How can they work with Nest? Where do you draw a line between you know what you want to do on the AI stack versus create an ecosystem for for others to uh, to build on top of? Yeah, from an, from an AI perspective, you mean? Yeah, I mean, there's Nest product, which is a platform. Yeah. It's the conduit to somebody's home. But there's a variety of applications, maybe in security, maybe in, yeah. uh, in personal health, that could be written by you or third parties. So any, any advice for startups in the audience on how they can work uh, with the Nest ecosystem to bring third party apps? Yeah, so we've, uh, at the basic uh, app and user experience level, so we have a set of a toolkit with a lot of API integrations that we we work with large to very small companies, even very early stage startup companies that are specific to home use. Um, on the AI side, um, we have also a toolkit that we partner with several, not necessarily startup, you know, third parties to, um, to do you know, more intelligence uh, around like demand response for energy. Mm -hmm. Um, so we've used their toolkits associated with that. So you know, a good, good use case is like demand response in, in peak time. Uh, we work very closely with uh, energy companies around their, um, you know, their own AI, if you will, and uh, attach that to the demand side of the consumer, and so they can start to balance peak load, um, you know, within certain certain days. Um, so I've, you know, if there are specific use cases that could tie into things related in the spaces that we provide to consumers, we're very open to that. Um, there are easy ways to integrate the products. Uh, we're, we're, op we're open to Got it. using somebody else's toolkits. We've, and so while we use a lot of foundational AI pieces that come from our kind of our parent companies, 
but we have, I mean, our staff, I'd say it's, it's growing. You know, 50% of our developers and engineers focus on what we call our nest brain, our AI, and that continues to grow. So we leverage also third party to do some of the machine learning stuff, especially around computer vision. So if there are tool sets around that, we're, we're open to use it. Okay. So is there, I mean, if I extrapolate that further, is there an Android-like play with Nest where, you know, you could primarily be a third party? Yeah, I mean, we, we have our own, we have our own platform we call the Thread and Weave. A thread is more about the communication la layer, is Weave okay. is more about the kind of foundational and API side. Um, and that, that works closely with our with Android. We think we'll, uh, um, we have the ability to attach the third party uh, okay. platform. Got it. So there is a Weave, what we, kind of a Weave platform that we use and our third party is integrated to. We have a couple of products that are coming out that uses that. Our Doorlock will be the first kind of a true Weave applications. Uh, we have two more products this uh, next year that we're launching, launching with that. So, and they're not like Nest build product, they're third party products. Got it. Okay. So th this might be more of a, a question for you personally than the official Nest answer, if you will. But if you think about AI as the intelligence layer, but it's also really creating this human computing interface, if you would, right? Where obviously you can recognize my face and let me into a phone these days. Um, my son, you know, unfortunately, he's just been going to Alexa and ordering a bunch of, you know, Draymond Green T-shirts that show up at my home. Um, what's what's your personal view? Is voice the natural interface? Is is images, videos, vision? Like what, what is the new human computing interface, if, if you will, uh, in your view? Uh, and voice is becoming, has grown at an incredible uh, pace that uh, I, I would not have predicted. Uh, mm -hmm. People feel more integrating um, using, you know, Assistant, Google Assistant or Alexa. And if, if you look at sales numbers from both on Google uh, hardware side as well as Amazon, they're, they're really impressive numbers. I mean, yeah. they're, tens of millions of those devices. Um, we're incorporating in our device, in our cameras, that same capabilities. Um, third party service providers and their, um, and their remote controls. Um, and so we're seeing voice almost getting to a point becomes a dominant. It's, it's still today, uh, mobile devices, for, at least for Nest products, yeah. uh, is the kind of the dominant interface in controlling um, what devices you want to see, especially if you want to watch video there's quite a, uh, you know, um, of your cameras and, you know, you know cast some of that into um, um, different screens. So you, we, uh, there's, it's a lot easier, actually. Um, uh, there's, there's a lot of stuff that's not still very intuitive on, around the voice and the integration just starting. Yeah. Um, so I could easily go, okay, I want to see my garage door camera by, by using my app. So, yeah. Um, I think you'll see more and more. We've talked about this when we launched our doorbell camera, and so we've, uh, we'll tell you your son is at home. You want to you know, show up at the door without ringing the doorbell or yeah. when they open the door, that kind of stuff. They, um, and uh, your son will be able to talk to you from your doorbell and tell you, hey, Dad, I'm home. I uh, haven't seen the Raymond Green package yet. It hasn't showed up. Um, six of them sitting six in the mailbox right now. Yeah. Some, uh, hopefully some yeah. of them swipe it. Yeah. But what would be a killer application is when I'm sitting watching my football game, I can just talk to Ness to you know bring me a beer and it's going to alert my son <laughs> to bring me a beer. That would be a killer app. I'd buy uh, it. We haven't built robots to bring you beers yet. But, uh, my son. My son's good. Uh, well, you, we could try to convince your son to see if he can. Yeah, yeah, seriously. It is funny. The last night I was sitting uh, talking to a friend of mine, uh, having dinner, and he calls up. and. His name is Alex. So every time I say, hey, Alex, what's up? Alexa oh, pops yeah. up. I was like, just, can I get some time to myself? It's, it's crazy. Um, that's great. Um, what, what, um, what's your, also, your view? There's a lot of drama in this old AI space saying, well, it's going to displace jobs. It's going to, you know, humanity is screwed. Like any, any of that extreme, if you will. What's your view? Do you think the application of artificial intelligence is a net positive or a net negative for, for the economy? Oh, for the economy? Yeah. It's certainly a net positive. Yeah. What about um, all these jobs uh, that are going to be dislocated and everything? I, you you I, buy into the drama? I don't know the dislocations. It's more of a migration into different areas. I think we need to do a better job in the training and, and uh, um, you know, or retraining people moving in different spaces. Um, um, you know, we need more people to do more stuff. It's yeah. not like we're hiring less people, even on the, on the uh, manufacturing side. Um, so I, I don't, and when I don't, certainly don't see that. I think the traditional economy is struggling for many reasons. I don't yeah. think it has to do with AI. It has to do more yeah. around automation, huge and product, reason, yeah. productivity, and diff different reasons. But on, on the uh, 
maybe ethical part of the question on AI, what yeah. happens, and whether you're Stephen Hawking or Elon Musk, and whether that's that's a net negative. Uh, I not necessarily don't necessarily agree with that. I think um, there's you know, we to to get to a point where you know singularity. Um, where computers start to outthink us and, and do uh, do things better than we do, I think that's a long, long way. Yeah, uh, I don't. It's just like <coughs> hopefully you and I will retire by then. Uh, so we don't uh, worry I think about it'll it. be. Uh, I worry. I worry about things a lot more important than that. Uh, whether we'll deplete our <laughs> natural resources on this planet, uh, <laughs> uh, how much uh, global warming is going to impact us, and uh, uh, geopolitical issues. I think we'll worry a lot more about that yeah. and solve that before we you know, start thinking putting some limitation. I. Um, I was reading something, um, it was an MIT uh, AI review, and uh, one of the quotes is, you know, we tend to overestimate technology's capabilities in effect early on and underestimate it uh, in, in the long term. And I think that's what's happening. You know, we, we were overestimating AI's capability that's going to take over our lives. Yeah. Right? I, I think it will be many, many, many lives before we get there. And I think our ability to, to put the checks and balances around uh, around that will continue to improve over time. So yeah. I, I, I don't worry about that. I yeah. think it's to stifle that and to give it that connotations as you know, this is going to be bad and evil. Uh, we've heard that before on many different things. And I think eventually the, the innovations and the products and the ability for us to do things to, to make people's life a lot better, that, that, takes, that takes over a lot and overwhelms some of these negative uh, uh, conversations. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you guys are solving real problems. But somebody was telling me the other day, like, how hard can this venture capital business be? Machines can predict investments better than humans. And I said, that's absolutely possible. Mm. If you figure that out, I'll invest in that company. So you know, we'll, uh, I think there's opportunity on both sides. Um, how, on the other hand, though, how do you kind of balance you know, convenience and privacy, right? Because many of the examples you mentioned can make my life so much easier. It's like, hey, I can just sit there, get the flash briefing for the day, order things online just you know, by talking to Alexa or to, uh, to Google device, Google Home. Um, but by the same token, it knows everything about me, more so than I would want it to know. So how do you, how do you balance that out as you design your product roadmap? Yeah, it, it's a very important issue. It's a, it's a key issue. It's, it's one of the key principles that we think about. You know, that privacy with consumers, we can never break, because once you break it, you can never get, get it back. Yeah. Um, you know, the principle that we have around privacy is consumers always control. <coughs> You're always in control. You're always in control how much data you want to share with us. You're always in control, um, you know, what use cases do you want to enable and let us, um, you know, improve, you know, different product or services to you. Yeah. And that, that's the case. And if, if even, you know, if, you, if you're a Nest customer today within your app, you can turn off, you know, energy data savings if you decide. Not cool, but if, you, if that's something you're concerned about, you can turn it off. The same thing around the ability to shut off your cameras anytime, anywhere. And, um, and those are, those are things that, as a consumer, it's very important. And I think there are some, there will always be bad actors in the, in the space that would make it tough, tougher for us, that you get sometimes having to have defend that. I was, I was in Washington, D.C. about three weeks ago, you know, and talking to some of, the, some of the agencies and Congress, talking to congressmen and senators, and that's top of mind for them. Right? Yeah despite all the other distraction, but they're top of mind. They ask the same thing. They have question. a lot more to lose in yeah. terms of people knowing what they're doing. Um, but, yeah. but, so, but, but you help start yeah. educating them about what privacy issues, what True. the security of devices, how important that is. And, and we've, shared, we've shared with a lot of staffers at, on the Hill as well as different government agencies. These are the best practices. We want mm -hmm. you to give this to our competitors. That's what they should do, both around secu uh, the security of the, the product and the services as well as the privacy things mm. that it's, I think it's the right thing to do. Got it. It's shifting gears. I know we're running out of time here. So one last question I have for you before we turn over to the audience. Uh, one of the areas that there has been a really big challenge for both startups and large companies, both tech and non-tech, is just recruiting people in this space. Yeah, and you I'm tell sure, me. I know. Uh, you know, once the VC thing is taken over by AI, if you have a job, I'll come apply for that. <laughs> so uh, I may be no good. But uh, well, how, do you, how do you tackle that? Um, so we, we have the same challenges as startups, especially here in the Bay Area. It's really tough. The so when I was I started as an engineer, um, you know, twenty some 
a long time ago. Um, <laughs> I go and I um, and I wish and I you know I wish I was you know starting my career now because you get to choose what to work Seriously. on. Seriously, you get to exactly choose what company right. to go for, for, and it's so competitive because there's so many opportunities. I think we div um, our solution has been around uh, diversifying um, geography. We're okay. starting to um, um, open more places across the country that and maybe in the past we haven't done. So diversifying geographies. Um, We've, uh, we've also started to develop you know, programs around, give people the ability to um, internally, within the Alphabet family, um, to work on projects that, you know, in a seamless way so it's not disruptive. And so we focus on retention of developing our talent, and we're also trying to recruit in areas that normally, it's, not, it's less competitive, but it's more retentive because you, people it. like certain geographies. Any, any new geographies of interest I can tell my startups to go recruit them? <laughs> I live in Colorado, so uh, Colorado is really great. Oh, Colorado is uh, great, yeah. Um, the, uh, you know, certainly we've, we're starting to look at uh, some of the southeastern uh, yeah. states, um, Chicago area, we've, uh, um, Seattle, it's, it's a, a lot. And I, I don't just think about North America, by the way. Uh, you should think about um, globally, lots of places. We have offices in Europe, from Ireland to London to Romania to... Um, Taiwan, I mean, you, you name it. Nice. So we're, we're, we're growing spaces. And, nice. and I think the key is for us, we don't necessarily look at individual people. We look at areas and functions we want to do that we think in, in areas a lot more effective than just trying to hire uh, kind of indiscriminate way, trying to get the right talent. Got it. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Well, I know we're over time here. Alicia, how much time? We have some time for Q&A from the audience? Yeah. Okay, so let me do this. Let me open it up to uh, the audience for any questions you may have for Marwan. Uh, based on the discussion. Any, any questions? Raise your hand and we'll bring mics around. There you go. Russell wanted yeah. a mic here. He's going to yeah. speak up. Yeah. Uh, so you talked about AI first as you're building new products, but how do you do that with small data sets? Uh, so you're building a new product, right? You might not have access to the large data sets you need to, to start with AI first. So I'm curious to hear more about how you do AI first, how you. Yeah, so I mean, we've, um, you know, we're we'll down all the way to kind of the silicon level is what data that we have easier access to pull from from that. And then when we tie it to the other services platform, um, how, what's, uh, what, what is our ability to productize uh, that? And so it's not an afterthought that we, we built, we have a hardware, and then now we have to figure out how to pull that. So maybe that was, maybe we started with, that, that's a big difference in, on the design. Um, it's no different than how we think about ID. Now we think about the actual layout of arch the architecture of collecting data. It's mostly around the collection and the ability to do that. And then so it's not so much about small sets versus large sets. Uh, we tend to make sure that the devices, the, the data collected, uh, they could be part of much, much bigger. And then the other thing that we do is also, we've, um, we've added the capability that within the home, Device to device to communications and data sets are important. I use the use case of, of, uh, of the smoke detectors talking to the, uh, talking to the thermostat. That's important to us. And that's a device to device communications. The data sets between them have to be congruent or ability for them to understand that without, because you could lose your connectivity. You could lose your, I mean, your service provider is not 100% re uh, reliable. So design it in a way that you, those devices could do something that is meaningful if needed. Great. Other questions? Yeah. Go ahead, Daniel. Yeah. So, Mike Amber. Yeah. Uh, appropriate giving my questions about voice. Uh, so you, you talked about how voice as input is certainly going, making big strides. But I'm really curious about voice as output, where it seems much more difficult, particularly if you get to conversation, compared to the screen that has more affordances for uh, not getting it perfectly right. What's your experience there? It is. It's, it's a great question. It's. Uh, we spend a lot of time trying to figure out and trying to get the right, the right tone, the right cadence of that voice and the output. Every, you know, with the exception of our thermostats, every uh, device we built has a speaker that talks back to you and it gives you instruction from early on in the installation experience uh, to um, tells you that there's a, um, you know, there's certain things you need to do. So you know, we use, for example, this is something I, I, I found out when I. When I joined Nest, so we did quite a bit of research about our smoke detectors, and the voice that comes out of that. It doesn't beep; it talks to you. And what type of voice do we do we use? And the research we came up with, and it has to do with children, that authoritative women's teacher's voice, 
is the most important voice for yeah. a child to listen to. It brings to. back bad memories. Yes. Yeah. And that's, you know, when the safety of the child is, when you tell a child, danger, leave now, that child has to respond to it. So that type of research, we spend quite a bit of time, and we spend quite a bit of time around localizations, meaning as we expand internationally. Um, it hasn't been the compatibility of our product, is the ability to find the right voice interactions, um, because if, with the exception of our thermostat, every product talks back to you. Hmm. That's nice. Other questions? Go ahead. So you talked a little bit about uh, networks and, and low latencies. What impact is, would low latencies have to Nest? What, what set of capabilities would the devices be able to do with the latencies coming lower? And what are sort of the metrics around that low latency to make it interesting for you? And yes, I work for a carrier. Yeah, I don't, um, I'm not sure I can share with you specific numbers, but I, I could tell you um, getting an alarm of a door is open, it has to be instantaneous. Um, latencies, uh, so while there could be latencies around watching your video, that's okay, but having missing an alarm, because that particular event is very important for us to get to you right away. So um, you talk about your doorbell um, from that incumbent company. We think our doorbell is gonna have uh, the best latency when you ring that doorbell and the ability to see it on your phone. So that is, it's uh, in the milliseconds. Um, so we think about that architecture a lot in, uh, on the device and the communication back to the cloud because every single one of those has to go back to the cloud, come back to you, whatever you are, um, and, and it has to be something in the middle of seconds. It cannot be a second or two. So we have a lot of, and unfortunately, there's a lot of dependencies on so many networks that we cannot control. Um, but if anything, if we control, it happened to be in, in device that, that we, we tend to um, you know, talk about in the tens to less than 100 milliseconds type of uh, time frame. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. No, after you. Um, who, who owns the data? Maybe it's an obvious question. Who, own, who owns the data? Who, who owns the data stream from the home and has it impacted by something like the EU GDPR and this kind of stuff? Yeah. Personally uh, GDPR, one of my favorite things to think about. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, you own your own video. Um, you own your own video, your own video. We, 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 don't, we encrypt it. We don't see it. We never see it. Um, we discard it after, uh, you know, your service. We never, we never keep that. That's, you own that. But, uh, we, uh, but when it comes to data that's associated, let's say, around energy usage, um, that's, that's where we, uh, we, in our task with our customers, we're open about that. We're using this data associated with trying to make, you know, trying to make sure that you can save you know, 10, 15, 20% on your energy. So the debate it will probably in Europe will be interesting to have. Um, it's not so much about the ownership of data, the data has to travel with you. The, and I think that's some of the conversation going on GDPR that's problematic and we're trying to figure out, I'm not sure how practical that is. Like we, because some of the data that we use is, 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 a, is a confluence of different type of data. Some of, it comes, some of it come from the energy company, some comes from your users, you're being home or not, others come from devices, third comes from the analytics and some of the AI that we do. Um, and it all comes together into one set. How do you parse that? And that becomes really complicated. Um, I think we, the, the best way we always describe it to our customers, the use set of the data is tied to something that the consumers always control whether they want to turn on and off. Actually, that does bring up a good question if I, if I may just add on to it, which is, if you are building a company today from scratch, and I'm sure that's true for Nest as well, what, where is the competitive mode over time? Is it the data mining algorithms? Is it the data itself? Is it the, you know, the compute infrastructure that improves latency? Where do you think, you know, where is the most durable mode over time? Uh, I, I think, yeah, I mean, I, I think the algorithm is gonna be the biggest differentiator. Mm. Um, because I mean, you talked about democratizing a lot of the stuff around capabilities, and the same thing happened with AI. Because a lot of stuff that we're, we put, you know, Alphabet is making available in open source. Right. So uh, computing will be there. You just have to figure out how much you're going to pay for it. Um, uh, the, the tools will be available for people to license yeah. and use. Uh, what we differentiate ourselves is we spend a lot of time building our own algorithms that's specific to our own devices. This is where we're investing and putting resources on. Got um, it. And that's you know, that's how we. 
our ability to, we have kind of our secret sauce to analyze frame by frame that differentiate us compared to some of the, like on, for, for video feeds, compared to some of the competitors that sell cheaper cameras than ours. Yeah. But I think there's stuff that we do that we don't miss a single thing. Got it. Which may be true with you know, your, your, your base of 5,000 engineers writing algorithms, right? But if you're a startup that is building an AI-oriented company, can you, can you effectively compete with a Google Nest on algorithms? I, I, I don't think you're competing uh, with the algorithm. I think you'd create your own. I mean, we've, when Nest started, we weren't part of uh, Google. True. Um, True. And, you know, the, my current CTO, uh, Yoki Matsuwaka, was the, the algorithm guru. True. She's currently the CTO for Nest, and she had a group of three or four people. Mm. Uh, you know, she came from that background, a lot of machine learning AI background from CMU, University of Washington. I think you start small. Um, we happen to have, you know, we're, we're now a very large company. That's why our, you know, our uh, Nest Brain team continue to grow. Got it. But because we have so many different use ca cases around so many different products out there. Fair enough. Got it. Go ahead. Just on that sentiment of democratizing AI as a service, do you see a trend where the devices are decoupled from the AI, where you don't have to get the device to get the AI, or you can pick your own device to get the AI? Uh, Nothing different than mobile carriers. Like yeah. Last two years, you have to get locked into the device and the mobile carrier. Now you have the freedom of choice to yeah. pick a device, yeah. and you go pick a service. I. I um, so the portability of devices on the connected home is different than mobile devices. I mean, our, our devices are attached to, uh, to a structure and as well as attached to a cloud and network. Um, you can certainly move it to another facility. Um, and the intelligence for the device gets reset because there are different conditions. So not necessarily related to Nest, but I could see that um, in the you know, different type of devices that you have at home, mostly maybe on the entertainment side. Um, maybe connectivity side, that this is how you want to set up your, your network. Um, but when you talk about home security and safety and energy savings, um, those are kind of, they're specific to structures less than the devices. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes. Okay. Stick with Google and Nest. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> You talked about devices talking to each other, communicating with each other within the Nest family. Is there any work being done around interoperability? And similar to the previous question, you wanna, so it was about taking algorithms out of the devices. What if I could go buy a bunch of sensors? Is there any standards and work yeah. being done around interoperability that I can apply all of this stuff and things will work seamlessly? Yeah, no, uh, uh, great questions. And uh, we believe in that. Uh, we've, we've uh, pioneered in open source a couple of key areas, one around threat, which is radio-related uh, um, capabilities uh, for device-to-device -device connection that's available. Uh, Weave is now open source, so there's a Weave 1.0 kit that you can use. That's something we invested in. We want third-party devices to be connected to, to that. Now, I cannot speak for other platforms um, by other companies, uh, but I could tell you for Nest, those are things that are available for you too. If you have sensors, we've worked with companies that build sensors and now they're integrating using our Weave tool sets and uh, the company that's building some like water sensors we're working with them. So many, many different cases like that. Are there any consortiums or forums that actually bring that together or not yet? Um, it's in the works. But right now you, you can reach out to us and those things are available in open source. Great, okay. Well, uh, I think we're out of time over here just to be mindful. So this is very, very helpful, uh, Marwan. Yeah, Thank you so much fun. for it was good to see sharing you. your perspectives. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you so much.